Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Chris. Uh, today, I'll be speaking to you uh, about how to get more explainable AI using asymmetric Shapley values. Um, and just a quick note about uh, the plan. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to get, get my presentation done in about 45 minutes, and then we'll leave the last 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, you can type your question in, all, questions in all throughout the presentation, um, and I'll be able to see them at the end and, and, answer, and answer them at that time. OK, so let's get started. OK, so uh, before we get into it, let's go over what I have planned uh, for the hour. I'll begin with an introduction to faculty, as well as uh, my role at the company. Um, and then I'll give some background on AI safety um, and, and how we think about that at faculty. Um, and then we'll get into the, the main part of today's talk. So I'll, I'll uh, give you some background on how Shapley values can be used or first of all, what they are and how they, how they can be used for AI explainability. And then I'll show you how um, at faculty, we've figured out how to incorporate causality into AI explainability with the modification to Shapley values that we call asymmetric Shapley values. Um, after that, I'll go over um, some applications of ASVs. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, uh, we will do Q&A. Okay, so um, first a little bit about faculty. Uh, faculty is an applied AI company founded uh, about six years ago uh, with the goal of making AI real. And by that, we just mean making it accessible and impactful for anyone who would like to see how AI can transform their business. Um, and despite being a relatively young company, we've worked on hundreds of very successful projects uh, with leading companies around the world and in many different sectors of the economy. Okay, and at faculty, we believe that making AI real is synonymous with uh, making it safe. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's why faculty has an R&D team that focuses on original research and found on the foundational problems in AI safety. Um, like these are the, these are the problem, yeah, sorry. So uh, despite being a relatively small team, uh, as you see on the slide, we've already made uh, like a significant amount of progress on these problems. Um, for example, with, with around 13 research papers in the past uh, two years since the, the team was founded. Um, that's me again in the middle. My name's Chris. Um, I'm a research scientist on the R&D team at faculty and I'm a primary contributor um, to our AI safety research work. Um, I've focused primarily on explainability and robustness, um, but we've also uh, worked on privacy and fairness as well. Um, but explainability will be the, the main topic of today's talk. And uh, before I get into it, I should also mention that um, today I'll be presenting uh, research that we published at NeurIPS last year on asymmetric Shapley values. And this is work that uh, we did with someone outside of faculty named Colin Rowett, who is a, an economist at the University of Birmingham. So I wanted to give, give him credit up front too. Okay. All right, so let's talk about um, how we think about AI safety and how we define it um, on the research team at faculty. So generally when people think about AI safety, a variety of different uh, specific risks and uh, worries come to their minds. Uh, some of these things like, for example, political disinformation um, are already becoming a problem today, whereas others like existential risk um, are a bit farther off in the future. Um, and at faculty, we structure these safety concerns along two axes. Um, where the, the horizontal axis is the intention of the human designer of the AI algorithm, and the uh, vertical axis is the, the autonomy level of the AI algorithm. So on the horizontal axis, we, we can have uh, benign intentions um, in design or, or even malicious intentions like for political disinformation. Um, and then along the vertical axis, we have like human controlled AI, for example, uh, machine learning models that are in use today, 
whereas farther up we have um, autonomous decision making where the uh, AI agent uh, you know, collects data and makes decisions over much uh, longer periods of time and has a lot more freedom to do so. Um, and so the, the bottom of this plot is sort of uh, the, the AI safety concerns that are already relevant today. And as you go farther up, um, it's concerns that are farther into the future. Um, and on the R&D team at faculty, um, we've, we've focused primarily in the bottom left sector um, of this two by two grid, um, that this is AI that's in use today, that's designed with benign intentions, um, but uh, the designers would just like to make sure that uh, they've taken all safety risks into account. Um, and some of these risks, uh, just to put a third axis on this plot uh, for color, uh, some of these risks are technical problems, amenable to technical solutions, whereas others um, are, are more uh, on the policy side. And so just to be a little more specific um, on the R&D team at faculty, we focused on these technical problems in the bottom left corner uh, that I'll go into a little more detail about now. Okay, so like I said, faculty focuses on technical AI safety for models deployed today. Um, and we have identified sort of four pillars of uh, AI safety uh, that's important for uh, models already in use today. Uh, these four pillars are explainability, robustness, privacy, and fairness. Um, explainability is what I'll be focusing on today. That asks the question, you know, how does the model make its decisions? Um, and can, it, can a human understand that, that decision-making process? Um, uh, and then there's also these other three uh, pillars. So robustness, uh, just to give you a sense, sense of that, it's sort of, uh, can you, can you uh, place uncertainties on the model predictions? Can you tell where a model is going to be overly confident in the real world? And can you tell uh, when the inputs to that model um, are, are sort of anomalous and, uh, and should not be trusted? Um, and then privacy, uh, can sensitive information be extracted from the model? Can you learn things about the individuals that were present in the model's training data if you just have access to the model? Can you expose their private information? And then on the right, fairness um, is the objective that you're training your model to achieve. You know, for example, maximizing accuracy um, is is that really consistent with anti-discrimination laws? Um, are your prediction errors uh, balanced across sensitive groups like different ethnicities or different genders, or is your model really performing well on the majority group and performing poorly? You know, making sacrifices uh, on minority groups. Um, so these are the four areas we focus on. Uh, and like I said today, I'll be focusing uh, in particular in this presentation on explainability. Okay, so now let me tell you about the Shapley value framework for AI explainability. Um, and let me tee it up by just giving you um, some additional thoughts on why explainability is so important. So uh, explainability plays an important role at all stages of the model life cycle, uh, beginning with development through validation um, to its time during production and uh, you know, in perpetuity uh, as, as the mon models being monitored. Um, so during development, explainability is useful uh, because if you, if you understand how a model is making its decisions, uh, you can understand its failure modes and you can correct for those and make iterative improvements to your model. Um, at validation time, so uh, explainability can facilitate like the quality control process uh, for models to be internally approved um, at, at your organization. You can also improve like stakeholder trust in the model and, and demonstrate that your model is satisfying regulatory requirements uh, sometimes explainability is sort of the law. Um, then at production time, um, explainability uh, or explain, explanations in particular can be offered to the model users who can incorporate uh, those into their like human decision-making processes. So uh, if they understand why a machine learning model is giving them a certain prediction, they can, they can determine whether that's relevant um, for their business decision or whether they should ignore it. Um, and then during monitoring, um, 
uh, as as data evolves over time, uh, monitoring the, the way that your model's making decisions um, and whether the important features that are driving your model's predictions are changing over time uh, might indicate that like retraining is in order after a while. So that's why explainability is so important, important and it's really lies at the heart of, of all of AI safety. And uh, there are plenty of different methods um, out there for doing AI explainability. And so on this slide, I'm just sort of trying to categorize them um, and give you some direction on, on which methods we think <clears throat> are more useful than others. So there's sort of three dichotomies that exist inside of AI explainability. And that's the three rows here. So I'll take them one at a time. The top row um, is whether your AI explainability method is requiring intrinsic interpretability or whether it's a post hoc method. So intrinsic interpretability, that would be like a very simple linear model or a decision tree with not too many nodes where once the model's trained, you can literally look at the model and understand how it works. You know, maybe it's just a rules-based system and you, you understand, you know, the, the nine rules that are involved in decision-making and uh, then you understand the decision-making algorithm itself. Whereas on the right-hand side, post-hoc explainability allows you to train an arbitrarily complicated model and then explain it after the fact. And um, we, we think that that is, has some clear advantages over intrinsically interpretable methods. Namely, um, it, it doesn't put any limit on the amount of performance that you can achieve with your model. So if you're requiring your model to be simple and interpretable, uh, that's gonna place a limit on model capacity and complexity and therefore on model performance. Whereas on the right-hand side, post hoc methods work with the with the state-of-the-art machine learning methods um, that achieve the highest accuracies in their domains. Um, so that's why we prefer the right-hand side. Uh, the second dichotomy is the model-specific methods versus model-agnostic methods. A model-specific method is a method that's developed specifically for a certain modeling uh, model class. For example, a random forest. So there's maybe there's an explainability method specifically for random forests or specifically for convolutional neural networks where you interpret or, or try to visualize what individual nodes in your network are, are learning. Um, whereas on the right-hand side, model agnostic methods treat the model like a black box and they only probe the decision-making process by putting different inputs in on the left and seeing what outputs uh, come on the right. And so those methods work regardless of what's going on in the black box, whether it's a decision tree or a convolutional neural network or the, the, the new architecture that, that's invented next year. Um, they, they sort of work on everything and they provide a common language for explainability so that if you know your data science team is, if their modeling techniques are evolving, uh, the, the uh, explainability algorithm does not have to evolve and the language around explainability can remain constant, um, which is useful, you know, for communication to, uh, you know, less expert audiences. Uh, that so that they won't have to, you know, learn new explainability techniques every time the modeling strategy changes. Okay, then the bottom dichotomy is global versus local. So global explanations uh, tell you how the model works overall on the whole across all the data. I'll just give you a general idea. Whereas local explainability uh, focuses on how a particular decision was made for a particular input. Um, so local explain explanations are really necessary in many cases. You know, if you need to explain to a customer why they were not granted a loan, you need to explain to them what happened in their individual case and what they might uh, do differently next time. Um, and the other nice thing about having a local explainability method is uh, you get global for free just by aggregating the local explanations over the whole data set. So that is some of the explanation behind why uh, we prefer post hoc model agnostic local explainability methods. All right. And it turns out that Shapley values, uh, which I'll be telling you about over the next several slides, um, Shapley values provide a great starting point for principled explainability that is post hoc 
um, model agnostic and local. Um, so one of the nice things about Shapley values is that they're founded on a set of mathematical axioms. Um, they have in interpretable units. For example, they sum to the model accuracy. Um, they satisfy uh, properties like linearity, nullity, and symmetry, which are all pretty intuitive properties uh, that uh, that I'll get into a little bit later. And um, on the right, it just shows you what Shapley values look like. Um, so if you have a model, for example, here's a model that predicts a certain uh, person's salary um, based on certain demographic features uh, shown on the bottom. Um, the Shapley values just tell you which features the model is uh, making most use of uh, when it makes this prediction. So apparently like marital status and education are, are two of the main uh, predictors of an individual salary, at least in the 1994 US census. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about um, Shapley values. So they're mathematically principled and they're, they're pretty intuitive. They satisfy these intuitive properties. Um, so let's get into uh, what, what they really are and how, how one computes them. So Shapley values um, have the goal of attributing a model's prediction, uh, its output uh, to the model's input features. And they do this in a pretty natural way. So for example, here's a, here's a model, a neural network that has three input features, x0, x1, and x2, and a single output, y. And if you wanted to ask the question, what's the importance of x1, uh, the second input feature, in making this prediction y, one way that you might think about testing that is just withholding x1 as an input feature to the model and seeing uh, how that affects the model's prediction. You know, how much would the model's prediction have been different if it didn't have X1 to work with? Um, and so Shapley values uh, are a one way to answer this question. And the Shapley value uh, got its start in cooperative game theory. So let me go over a little bit of the background and I think that will uh, let me intuitively build them up and define them for you as well. Okay, so here's how Shapley values work in cooperative game theory. So let's uh, think of a very simple scenario to uh, motivate these. So suppose a company of three people earns $100 profit. Um, how should they distribute that profit um, as salaries? So um, on the left, V stands for value. So the, the value that these three individuals created, the CEO, the tech person, and the salesperson um, is 100. And we would like to um, attribute that among the three individuals. Uh, so phi um, is, is gonna be the Shapley value later, but now let's think of it as like the salary or the attribution. So um, what should that be for each individual? So, um, in thinking about how to answer this question, suppose that the company formed in this following order. So suppose first on the left, the CEO is the only person working at the company. And with, with only the CEO, um, uh, the profit would not have been 100, it would have been 30 um, if the CEO were working alone. <clears throat> uh, suppose next that the tech person joins and then uh, the profit goes up from 30 to 50. And then suppose next the salesperson joins and that's what, what puts the, the profit from 50 all the way up to 100. Well, uh, we might be tempted to award each member their sort of value added as salary. So we might say, okay, the CEO deserves 30, the tech person added 20, and then the salesperson added 50. So Shapley values um, are defined sort of like this except they say, well, that, that was too sensitive to the order in which people joined uh, the company. What we should really do is average over all the orders that, that the three members could have joined the company. So that's averaging over all the permutations of this set of three individuals. So um, on this slide, I'm trying to define um, the Shapley values pretty precisely, even though, it's, even though it's a picture. So on the left-hand side, this is all the permutations in which members could have joined the company. So for three members, there's six orders, sort of three times two times one. Um, and then the Shapley formula, for example, tells us how to compute the salary of the tech person. It says, 
take this difference in values um, every time the, uh, the tech person joins the company um, and average over all the orders that are on the left-hand side. So in the first ordering, it goes purple, blue, yellow. So purple, blue, that's when the blue person joined. And before the blue person joined, it was just purple. Um, and so we do that on all six lines and average the sort of value added um, of the tech person um, and uh, to compute their Shapley value. Okay. So that's what the Shapley value is in cooperative game theory. And here's how the Shapley value has been adapted for uh, model explainability and machine learning. So um, as you might have uh, realized that on the game theory side, what we were calling players, um, on the machine learning side, we're gonna try to think of as the features, x0, x1, and x2. The total earnings, the, the sort of thing we're trying to uh, explain and distribute among the players on the left-hand side, which we've been calling V for the value function. On the right-hand side, um, the thing we're going to try to explain in machine learning is the model output. So if I call the model F, um, then I want to explain F up, applied to X0, X1, and X2. So I want to explain, uh, you know, basically why the, the thing that comes out of the model. And then on the left-hand side, uh, the main ingredient for the Shapley value calculation was, be able, was being able to calculate a, a sub team's earnings. Uh, in game theory, this is called a coalition. So uh, the coalition of just the purple and the yellow player, instead, uh, which is smaller than the full, the full company, which is purple, blue, yellow. So uh, in order to calculate the Shapley value, we needed to be able to calculate the value that a coalition of players smaller than the, the full company would have earned on their own. And on the right-hand side, that's um, going to correspond to uh, basically the output of the model when you only plug in uh, a subset of the inputs, x0 and x2, for, for example, and not x1. So um, I do want to touch on one, one caveat here, um, which is it's not immediately obvious how to compute this thing on the bottom right. You know, for a neural network, you need to do a bunch of matrix uh, multiplication operations. And if one of the numerical entries is missing in one of your matrices, uh, you just can't calculate the, the model output. You have to plug something in for X1 or else the output is not defined. Um, and so I, I just want to uh, mention some other research uh, that we've done on the R&D team at faculty um, that I won't be presenting today, but that's related to this issue. Um, so first, let me tell you how this problem is overcome in, uh, in open source methods. Um, uh, and, then, and then I'll give you a, a, a short flavor of, of how we solve it um, at faculty. So, um, and then after that, I'll go on to the, the main part of today's talk, which is on asymmetric Shapley values. Okay, so, but first, uh, this problem of filling the empty feature slots with dummy values. So open source methods actually fill the empty feature slots with, it turns out, unrealistic values um, that assume features in the data are uncorrelated and independent. So uh, let me give you an example of how this works. So pretend that um, two of our, or that our prediction problem is to predict whether or not someone's gonna file an insurance claim. And maybe the first two features are the individual's age and their driving experience. So let's say that this individual's age is 21 years and their driving experience is four years. And then we're gonna try to estimate the importance of, uh, of feature X1, their driving experience on, on the, the model's prediction here. So um, if you leave X1 slot empty, of course you can't compute the model output, you have to fill it in with something. And so open source methods uh, primarily just draw a value of X1 from the rest of the data set. So they just insert some dummy value, which has been drawn from the rest of the data set. Um, the problem with that is that it assumes that this value um, is independent of all the other values that, that sort of X1 can take any value regardless of the values that X0 and X2 take. And this clearly isn't the case in most problems. So for example, if you wanted to fill the X1 slot driving experience with 
values that you grab from the rest of the data set. Well, you might grab a value of 15 years driving experience or seven years or 26 years. Um, because these are totally valid driving experiences that are going to exist across the data set. The problem with them is that they're not compatible with a 21 year old driver. Um, and so uh, this leads to like, questionable ex explanations um, uh, that, that don't really give you insight into how the model is going to perform um, on realistic data. Instead, just sort of telling you about how the model performs on these pathological cases. Um, so this is sort of a dangerous thing that's done in open source methods. And we think we call this the fictitious data problem. Um, so on the R&D team at faculty, we've solved uh, this fictitious data problem on the left, as well as two other major shortcomings of, op of open source explainability. Um, so we've got a paper deta detailing two of our solutions to the fictitious data problem, basically learning how to draw uh, dummy values for the empty slots from the correct conditional distribution rather than just drawing them uh, from the data. Um, and uh, the second main, the second major shortcoming of Shapley uh, values in the open source is that they don't allow you a way of incorporating causality. Um, that's what asymmetric Shapley values solve, and that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of the talk. Um, and then the third shortcoming that we have addressed is the interpretability of explanations. Um, so just to give you a couple sentences to motivate that one, um, as, as data sets become more and more complex and higher, higher dimensional, um, a method like the Shapley value method that explains the model outputs in terms of all its different inputs can become overwhelming basically when, you're, when your model has thousands or, or more maybe even millions of inputs, um, for example, in a like high resolution image. And the uh, explanation that a human really wants is not gonna be in terms of those millions of raw input features, but instead of some uh, higher level semantic concepts um, that sort of unite all the input features together in a human interpretable way. So uh, our paper on the right uh, that you can look up um, shows a way of giving more interpretable model explanations when you're in the high dimensional regime. But like I said, today I'm focused on asymmetric Shapley values and the problem of, of causality. Okay, so, so now let me walk you through how to incorporate uh, ideas in causality um, using asymmetric Shapley values. Okay, so first let me motivate the problem by giving you a, a very simple example of a case where causal structure is underlying a prediction problem. So consider this problem where, um, where there is some gene for a disease, or so we've got two input features, um, the gene for a disease, and then the symptom of the disease. Um, these are our input features, and on the output side, uh, what the model is trying to predict is the outcome of, of a related blood test. And just to make this uh, simple and motivational, let's assume that uh, the symptom of this disease is a deterministic byproduct of having the gene for the disease. So there's like a one-to-one -one relationship. If you have the gene, you have this symptom. If you don't have the gene, you will not have this symptom. And clearly there's a causal relationship between the gene and the symptom in this case, the gene causes the symptom and not the other way around. Um, okay, and so if we applied the Shapley framework to this problem, um, as I outlined it above, we would explain uh, the importance of the gene and the importance of the symptom by summing over all orderings in which these two uh, quantities could sort of join, join the input space. Um, we would sort of let the symptom join first and then add the gene and see how much the gene uh, changes the, the model output when it's added on top of the symptom. And then we would also let the gene join first and then add the symptom, oops, and then add the symptom. And so that's sort of uh, breaking the causal direction and the causal relationship between these two variables, sort of letting either one come first when really we know that the gene comes first and the symptom comes second. 
Okay, so now I'm going to build up um, the general formulation of asymmetric Shapley values um, with a few builds on this slide. Um, so first let's recall the, the general formulation of Shapley values. Um, so I went over it in the last section of the talk, but basically um, to summarize it in one slide, there's these four mathematical axioms um, that are assumed to be satisfied by the explainability method. And then assuming these four ma mathematical axioms, you can prove that the only way uh, to have an explainability method that satisfies them is the Shapley value formula. And this is sort of the machine learning version of the Shapley value formula uh, that I had with the smiley faces um, instead of equations um, a few slides ago. And so um, it's actually the symmetry symmetry axiom that is uh, causing the problem here. So the symmetry axiom of in the Shapley framework says that uh, features that influence a model prediction identically have to get equal Shapley values. So um, in the case of the gene and the symptom, since the gene and the symptom always either show up together or, or, or don't show up at all, um, they have the same influence or the same predictive power for the model output. And so the symmetry axiom would say, uh, you need to consider both orderings in which they could join, and that's gonna give you equal Shapley values for those two input features. That's sort of what's leading to this sum over all permutations and the average over one over n factorial. Uh, so equally weighting all the permutations. Um, now, what we might wanna do if we actually know something about the causal ordering of these two features is say, uh, the symmetry axiom doesn't shouldn't apply to this case. Uh, let's drop the symmetry axiom um, and uh, work with something that we would then call asymmetric Shapley values, where instead of um, equally weighting all the possible orderings that features can join the uh, input set, um, let's let's have the freedom to weight some of those. Maybe we'll weight uh, one of the orderings as one and the other one as zero. So let's weight the ordering where the gene comes first and the symptom comes second. Let's, let's place all our weight on that and let's not place any weight on the ordering in which the symptom comes first and the gene comes second. Let's see what my next slide is. Yeah, so um, let's go back to the pictures and show you what that would look like um, in the, the cooperative game theory example. So remember we calculated the, um, the Shapley value or the salary for the tech person at the company uh, using a, a picture like this, except uh, in place of the Ws, there was one over three factorial. So the one over three factorial for Shapley values says, okay, weight all these six possible orderings equally. Whereas here for asymmetric Shapley values, we have the freedom to choose different values of W1 through W6 to weight each ordering differently. Um, and in the case of the CEO, the tech uh, person and the salesperson, it might make sense to weight the first two orderings at one half and all the other orderings at zero. Um, with the reason being that, you know, maybe you can't, you can't have a company without a CEO. So it doesn't really make sense to have like only a salesperson join first and then a CEO join second. So we can negate those, those orderings um, and focus the calculation on the value added of the tech person, assuming that the CEO always joins first. And for in the case of the uh, disease with the gene and the symptom, um, we would place a weight of one on the ordering where the gene came before the symptom and a zero on the ordering in which the symptom came before the gene. So this basically just gives us a way to incorporate like domain expertise into the explainability algorithm, right? Because this takes some, some expertise to know what uh, some reasonable weights are. Um, and if you have that expertise, you can incorporate it. Okay, so that is the, the definition uh, of the asymmetric Shapley value. And um, over the next several slides, I'll go through some of some applications of these. Okay, so first uh, let's go with the main 
the main motivational application that I've been uh, hinting at the whole time. So how to incorporate the data's causal structure into model explanations. Uh, for this, let's go back to that example that I started with. So um, the example of predicting salary in the 1994 US census um, from uh, these demographic features. <clears throat> so just take a look for a minute at the demographic features that are involved. So there's marital status, education, relationship, occupation, all the way to like age, sex, native country, and race. There's gonna be a very complicated causal process that controls, you know, someone's life and um, how and and how you know whether or not they get married, what what their education is, what their job is, whether or not uh, uh, they they change countries and, and things like that. Um, so it's too much to ask really to be able to draw that whole causal web relating all of these features to one another. But what we can say uh, with some pretty good confidence is that some of these features are determined at birth. For example, your age, uh, your sex, the country you're born in, uh, your, your ethnicity. And the rest of them are determined later. Um, for example, your marital status, your education, and, and the job you take. Um, and so while we don't know the complicated causal relationships between all the individual features, what we do know is that these four features on the left come before the rest of the features on the right. And so what we can do is choose to, to only weight those permutations that don't break this, this like soft ordering. So we'll place zero weight on every permutation that for example, places marital status before native country. Um, but as long as um, these four features come before the rest of the features in the permutation, we'll just weight all of those evenly because we're sort of agnostic uh, to the precise causal structure besides the, uh, apart from this simple rule. Um, but if we look at the um, bar chart on the right, we can see that even incorporating this pretty uh, rough uh, causal knowledge into the model explanation can have pretty drastic consequences. So the gray bars show you the Shapley values um, that you get for this uh, prediction problem when you train a neural network to uh, explain, to, uh, to model this data. Um, and the most important feature is marital status and uh, relationship is also very important, but it's kind of a, a proxy for marital status. For example, marital status is like married or, or single and relationship might be husband. Um, and education is also important. Occupation is also important. And then things sort of just go down from there. Whereas um, if you compute the asymmetric Shapley values, sort of to, to try to understand more the root causes, uh, the root causes that are explaining the model's predictions um, instead of just the, uh, instead of treating all the features equally. Um, what we find is that for example, age and sex become very important. Um, sex becomes the most, the largest asymmetric Shapley value um, when, when we explain this model, um, sort of reflecting like the gender bias in the data, at, at least in the 1994 data. Um, that, and what this means is basically that sex by itself explains enough of the downstream features, for example, the ones that were found to be important downstream like marital status and relationship. Sex by itself explains uh, uh, the majority of the uh, model's prediction um, because sex is an influencer of all of these uh, downstream uh, variables. So anyway, uh, this is sort of showing you how ASVs can be used to understand model predictions in terms of root causes. Oops. Uh, this next one uh, will show you how um, ASVs can be used um, to, to answer questions of fairness. So, um, so yeah, so here's how ASVs can be used to disentangle a model's unfair dependence on protected attributes. 
Um, to show you how this one works, uh, let me walk you through this example on the left. So um, let's take the example of fairness in college admissions. And um, this is just some simple synthetic data that we uh, generated uh, for, our, for our paper to show how this works. Um, and so we generated the data by giving every, you know, randomly sampling someone's gender, uh, randomly sampling uh, a test score, for example, on their SAT or, or some college admissions exam. Um, then we allowed the genders to apply to different departments at the university at different rates. Um, and then uh, college admissions were determined based on someone's department choice and their test score. So this allows um, certain departments to be more exclusive or more competitive than other departments. And um, you, so you might consider this process to be fair. You might say, okay, college admissions will be different for each gender. So uh, for example, men might be admitted to college uh, at a higher rate than women are, but it's only because, at least in this data set, it's only because uh, men applied, say, to the uh, less competitive department and uh, women applied in greater numbers to the more exclusive department. And so that, you know, we don't want to take away uh, everyone's free choice in which department to join. And we sort of admit that some departments are going to be more competitive than others. And so we deem this process as fair. We sort of say that it's okay for gender to influence college admissions if it happens through this allowed pathway going through department choice. And so we can set up our asymmetric Shapley values to, to, um, to check whether or not this decision process is fair by making sure that gender joins the coalition or that gender joins uh, the set of inputs after department choice. That, will, that means that the ASV for gender will be telling us how much predictive power for college admissions does gender add on assuming I already know the department choice that the individual has, ma has made. In this data set, it's zero. So the asymmetric Shapley value for gender is zero um, because gender doesn't, doesn't add any relevant information on top of the individual's department choice for determining their college admissions. However, we also considered another data set alongside this one um, that adds a sort of disallowed pathway for gender to influence college admissions. Um, that's through what I've called an unreported referral. So maybe you know the, the, the frat um, at the university sort of makes a referral to the admissions uh, department and says, you know, Chris, Chris, uh, he's we know Chris, he's a good guy. Like, let's let's give Chris an advantage. Let's let him in. We want him to join our frat. Um, and and you know, don't put this in the data. Don't report this feature in the data. Um, this basically provides a way for gender to influence the college admissions process in an, uh, through an unfair pathway that's sort of not, not legal, let's say. Um, and so uh, this is affecting the distributions in the data, but the unreported referrals are not seen as a feature in the data. And what, what happens if we, if we compute the asymmetric Shapley values for a model trained on this um, unfair data, um, gender will uh, provide some extra relevant information for the college admissions on top of department choice. So even though we make sure that gender joins the input features after department choice has already joined, gender still adds some predictive power because gender will give you a sense of whether or not this individual was likely to have an unreported referral or not. And so when we compute the asymmetric Shapley values for the second data set, we do see that there's a non-zero um, ASV for gender here. And so this is sort of how uh, ASVs can be used to understand causal notions of fairness. Okay, so third, um, third application is on uh, explanations for time series. Um, and uh, the point here is that ASVs produce intuitive sequential and incremental explanations um, uh, for, for time series data. Um, I'll try to sort of go quickly so that we have some time for questions. I only have a couple more slides. 
Um, so the experiment we did to show to demonstrate this was on uh, EEG signals in a seizure recognition data set. So here's two EEGs on the left. Um, they're sort of measured over 180 readings over a, a second or so, I think. Um, and one of these signals um, is from a patient that was having a seizure at the time, and one of them is from a patient that was not having a seizure. Uh, the middle plot on this slide shows you the difference between a Shapley value explanation of, of the model um, on this on one of these input signals uh, versus an asymmetric Shapley value explanation. And while the Shapley value explanation sort of has to allow all of the input features, so all of the 180 readings to sort of join the inputs in any order, uh, which is sort of unnatural for a time series where we know there's a very well-defined order um, for the input features. Um, the asymmetric Shapley values allow us to say, uh, we're not going to put any weight on any of those, you know, out of time order orderings. Uh, we're only going to weight the uh, ordering in which, you know, time step zero comes first, time step one comes second, time steps two comes third, and so on. And what this shows in the middle plot is that the uh, Shapley value um, explanation sort of says that all of the time steps are giving you, uh, you know, roughly equal sense of whether or not this person is having a seizure. Um, so that's this pink line that is relatively flat compared to the, the green line. Um, and also notice that this is a log scale on the vertical axis, whereas the asymmetric Shapley values are, you know, a hundred or a thousand times higher for the first few time steps than they are for the last few time steps. And what's this, what this is really telling you is that most of the predictive power is coming from, let's say, 25 of the time steps. And once, you, once you've seen the first 25 readings, you can basically uh, shut the EEG off. You know whether or not this person is having a seizure. Um, and then the final plot here is just to show that um, that this isn't, you know, uh, you might worry, well, well, how do I know that it's really true that the 25, the first 25 readings um, are enough for, uh, to predict the model's output? Um, this is a, just sort of a check we did where um, the, the, the pink line and the green line, green line are the cumulatives from the middle plot. So just adding, um, so at time step 50, for example, it's just the sum of the first 50 Shapley values or the sum of the first 50 ASVs. And then we trained 180 different models for the gray curve um, for the um, accuracy that, the, that that model, for example, that only takes in the first 50 time steps would receive. And um, it's, it's almost a perfect match to the ASV curve. And so this shows you that ASVs really tell you, um, really tell you how predictive um, a, a set of features are um, in your input space um, for uh, predicting the model output. Um, this last ex this last application, I think I'm pretty much out of time, um, so I'll just skip to the punchline. Um, which is basically, as you can see from the plot, uh, this, is, this is like a time series of uh, COVID cases uh, with respect to date. And um, what you might wanna do here if, is uh, explain the predicted uh, COVID case rate two weeks in the future and understand um, which, uh, which of the last two weeks of data um, is, the, is most important for predicting and understanding where the case rate is going to be two weeks into the future. And because of the time ordering that's natural um, in, in this problem, um, similar to the previous slide, um, asymmetric Shapley values are the natural way to explain um, a forecasting model like this. And in fact, um, ASVs are currently deployed um, in, in real life to explain forecasts of COVID demand on hospitals within the UK's National Health Service. And in particular, um, asymmetric Shapley values are served 
alongside model predictions to the hospital operators to allow them to understand the forecasts uh, that affect their ability to schedule, for example, elective care. Um, so I can, I can come back to this slide if there are questions on the details here. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically it. Let me wrap up. Um, so I explained that explainability lies at the heart of faculty's AI safety program and that Shapley values provide a great starting point um, for, for model explainability with a few drawbacks that we've addressed both in this presentation and in a few of our other research papers at faculty. Um, asymmetric Shapley values in particular enable the incorporation of domain expertise, for example, causality or time ordering or fairness, for example, legality into model explanations. And um, as I just mentioned at the end, uh, asymmetric Shapley values are quickly proving to be very useful in real world high impact applications. All right, so that's the end of my slides. Um, now I'll start taking questions. All right, let me get the questions open. All right, so I'm just gonna read through them um, and uh, start uh, saying, saying my answers out loud. So there's a question um, about not really using the model input features to understand the model's prediction, but instead using data points that the model was trained on uh, to understand the model's prediction. So this relates um, perfectly to the application that I sort of breezed through at the end, um, which is in the, in the case of COVID demand, um, if we're trying to explain the uh, case rate two weeks in the future, in terms of the data that's come in over the last two weeks, you know, understanding, could we have made this prediction just with the data that came in a week ago, or has the last week of data actually been a crucial driver of this prediction two weeks out? Um, this is a, an application in which, um, you don't want to explain the model in terms of its input feature, because once you've trained this model, it's a time series. It's a curve with respect to time. Its input feature is just time. You really want to explain this model in terms of its training data, which is the data that defines the curve. In particular, for example, the last two weeks of data that were used to train the curve. Um, in that case, so this is what faculty has done in in our work with uh, the UK's NHS. Um, in this case, basically what you need to do is instead of treating um, these smiley faces as model input features, you have to treat the smiley faces as training data points and retrain a bunch of different models with or without a, a given set of, of, of input data to understand how important that input data is for driving the model's predictions. So because I said you have to retrain the model a bunch of times, these are much more expensive to compute, um, but they do give you uh, that special insight um, that was asked about in the question. All right, I'll keep reading these questions. Okay, so there's a question um, by uh, someone familiar with the literature on this point of filling in the uh, empty feature slots uh, with dummy values. And they refer to a paper uh, by uh, Janzing and collaborators uh, from 2019, which says that, or which claims that there might be a perspective in which drawing dummy values from the data set um, the, the sort of the thing I cautioned against, there might be a perspective in which that is sensible. Um, and so without going too much into it, um, I, I think our stance of faculty and mine personally is that I, I disagree with that perspective. And um, 
the, the argument that they make is basically that if you think of the model itself, the, the, the decision-making process itself as a causal process, um, the input features come into the model and then the model makes a prediction and there's no causal links between the input features if you're just thinking about the computer program that you're writing here. Then you don't have to worry about the fact that x0 might be causing x1 because you are just typing in values um, to your machine learning model and, um, and letting them flow through the model and give you your output. So at least in the application of the machine learning model, the causal links that are underlying the actual data generating, generating process might not be so relevant. Um, if you take a look at our paper that I've referenced here, uh, Shapley Explainability on the Data Manifold, uh, we give a lot of examples of how, um, if you take that approach, it gives very misleading explanations um, in, in crucial applications. So if you're interested in that, take a look at this, this paper. So there's a question about the main advantage of the Shapley method versus for example, XGBoost feature importance. Um, I would go back to uh, this slide here and say that, well, three of the advantages of the Shapley method um, are here on the right, that it's a post hoc model agnostic local explainability method. And for example, if you use a tree-based algorithm to explain uh, your model, and then you, you change your modeling uh, strategy, for example, maybe you switch from a tree-based model to a neural network. Um, then you have to change explainability methods, and then you can't compare the explanation of one of your models to the explanation of the other model. So I think this model agnostic um, advantage of Shapley values is, is quite important uh, for having consistent explanations, even as your modeling techniques evolve. There's a question about um, having a lot of freedom in the uh, domain expertise that you add into the asymmetric Shapley values. So basically in going from this slide with the W1 through W6 to this slide where you've made choices, one half, one half, zero, 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 zero. Um, and there's a, there's a question about, well, uh, maybe um, this choice could be controversial and engineered to mislead uh, the, the sort of model user. <clears throat> and I think that's a fair, a fair point. Sort of, there's a lot of freedom that you're granted um, in the asymmetric Shapley value framework. And therefore there's a lot of responsibility as well uh, to, to use that freedom uh, responsibly. Um, yeah, uh, I think that that's all I can say there. There's a question about um, marital status and relationship being proxies for one another. Um, and the question is, if, they're an, if, they're, if it's an exact proxy, does that mean that the Shapley value for marital status would double if you dropped relationship? Uh, the answer to that is yes, for Shapley values. However, for asymmetric Shapley values, if, for example, you decided that marital status should always come before relationship, so you, you make some preference, um, you, you impose some preference for marital status over relationship in your ASVs, and then you dropped relationship, uh, the ASV would be stable to that. It would not change at all because uh, you've already, so marital status always joins the coalition when relationship is absent. And so marital status always gets full credit. Um, and relationship always gets zero credit um, in, in that thought experiment. So it doesn't matter if relationships there or not.
there's a question about this uh, example um, about how some of these variables are correlated, uh, for example, sex and education. Um, and how does that affect Shapley values? So Shapley values, well, actually there's two, two approaches or two ways to think about that question and two ways, two things I should say in answering it. One is that the Shapley value framework as a general framework is completely fine with correlated, correlated uh, input features. Uh, there's nothing in this uh, like definition of Shapley values that assumes that the features uh, are independent or uncorrelated. Um, sort of if you had two tech people at the company, um, uh, the value of the sort of second tech person that joined would just be less than the value added when the first tech person joined. Because when the first tech person joined, you basically go from not being able to do any tech to, to being able to, to do some, some tech. And then when the second one joins, you just get a marginal benefit. And so that is totally accommodated by the Shapley framework. Uh, the thing that you have to be careful about though, is when features input features are correlated, you have to be careful about how you input the dummy values for the empty feature slots when you do the Shapley calculation. Um, and that's the point um, that I was briefly making up here, which I think I'll probably give another tech talk on in the future uh, because it, it's, a, it's another paper that we published. Um, but if X1, for example, is correlated with X0 as it is in this example, you should be careful about how you input X1 um, input dummy values. So for example, if you've got a 21 year old, because of the correlations between driving experience and age, you know that 15 and seven and 26 years of driving experience are just not compatible with a 21 year old. And so um, uh, the dummy values should be inserted into the empty slots in a way that's consistent with the correlations. Uh, there's a question about whether the unreported referral is a latent unobserved variable. Uh, that is correct. In this data set, uh, unreported referral was not included as a feature. So it's, it's unobserved. Um, there's a question about what the symmetric, the regular Shapley values would look like for this, um, in this fairness example. Um, the, the Shapley value for gender would just be generically non-zero in both cases, because in both cases, college admissions, admissions vary with gender. Um, and Shapley values give them, gives gender credit, just like it gives department choice credit, because in some of the the orderings that are considered in the calculation, gender joins first. And if gender is the only thing you have, you can make a prediction for college admission that's better than random. Um, and then when you add department choice to that, it will get become a better prediction. But gender uh, will get a generic non-zero Shapley value and therefore be not be able to distinguish cleanly between um, fair and unfair scenarios. There's a question about um, um, what would be the best slide to answer this? Okay, uh, yeah, I guess this is, a, I'll, I'll need to give a two part answer. So there's a question about um, whether the Shapley value should be computed um, by leaving, for example, certain players out or by filling them back in with a range of different you know, options. So say the CEO is absent, should we just 
think of a company with no CEO or should we think of a company with a few different options for the CEO, like a great CEO or a bad CEO or draw from the, the range of possibilities. Um, so in, in cooperative game theory, Shabley values are just defined by leaving players out of the game. But in model explainability, uh, it's sort of not possible to leave a player out of the game. You have to fill the input feature back in with some dummy value. So we're sort of forced to do with this uh, person asking the question, um, thought might be natural. We're forced to fill in the empty missing feature with dummy values. Um, and then the question is, what dummy value should we choose? Um, we think that the, the right answer is to just draw from the conditional probability distribution that says, what's the distribution over X1, assuming these two values are known for X0 and X2. So for a 21 year old, um, we would average the model outputs over driving experiences, say in the uh, zero to five year range. There's a question on whether we've applied ASVs to multivariate time series. Um, uh, so we've started doing research on that um, and, and we have explored that, that as an application. Um, that's sort of something that we're still working on. There's a question about whether there's gonna be a recording of this available. The answer to that is yes. Um, I, uh, so I think it's gonna be on YouTube, for example, and I'm sure if you want, uh, a link to that, you can uh, reach out. All right, well, it is nine minutes past the hour, so maybe I'll stop there. And I can look through uh, the rest of the questions offline. If you have uh, additional questions that, that I didn't answer, um, feel free to email us. Uh, so let me scroll down to the bottom to show you uh, where, to, where to send messages. So you can either send a message to info at faculty.ai, or you can send a message to me uh, personally at chris.f at faculty.ai. And um, I'll be happy to get back to you. All right, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'll sign off now.